I would like to introduce our last speaker, who is Dr. Michelle Giles McDonough. Michelle brings us back to the Caribbean, in a sense, coming from Jamaica. But uh, she is now the director of, sustain of the Sustainable Development Unit of the Executive Office of the Secretary General of the United Nations in New York. And we're really privileged to have the opportunity to have Michelle give us yet another of the perspectives on the issue of climate engineering. Throughout her career, Michelle has practiced privately as a lawyer, served as an advisor to the Secretary General of the Organization of American States, and has deep development experience within the UNDP, including as chief of UNDP's sub-regional facility for the Caribbean, the UN Resident Coordinator for Barbados and the OECS, Resident Coordinator for Malaysia, Singapore, and the Brunei Dar es Salaam, and was recently appointed as Deputy Assistant Administrator and Deputy Regional Director Designate for Asia and the, and the Pacific. And uh, when I met her and was talking with her, I was trying to pick out where she was from, from her accent, and I said, you are very hard to pick out from, and she said, yes, she's from lots of different places. <laughs> She's currently the director of the Sustainable Development Unit in the Executive Office of the Secretary General. Michelle holds a degree in law from Columbia University School of Law with honors in international and foreign law, a master's in public administration from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, and also a diploma in executive education from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. So you can see with that kind of a background why we've picked her out to give us a perspective here this evening. She received her undergraduate degree at the Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania. And tonight, she's going to be telling us about her perspectives on the international context for the geoengineering debate. Michelle. Thanks very much, Mark, uh, for that introduction, and good evening. It's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. I want to thank uh, the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies for inviting me to this conference on climate engineering. It gives me a great pleasure to be a part of this very important meeting and actually to have benefited from the presentations of our two previous keynote speakers, um, Michael and Oliver. Um, I took away from those two things that I will hope to try to pull together now in this final brief remarks, and that is the need for us to act now to deal with the unprecedented and the role of science and technology in the solutions and the complexity of the discussions that we need to have as we try to cross those frontiers and try to go through, you know, pierce the boundaries from where we are now and look at what it is we need to deal with going forward. You are the thematic experts, um, and so it is not my intention to provide you with views on the specific innovative technologies. What I would like to try to do is to share with you some thoughts on the global context in which your discussions about climate engineering are taking place, and the critical role that you all play in advancing innovative new technologies and solutions to address climate change and the other pressing development challenges and concerns for our planet and people, particularly the most vulnerable among us. As you're aware, the international community came together in September 2015, and it adopted a truly remarkable framework to transform our world. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, includes, including its 17 Sustainable Development Goals, apply to all countries. They're a plan of action for the next 13 years to significantly shift the world onto a sustainable and resilient path that leaves no one behind. The scale of the transformation required by the 2030 Agenda and the 17 Goals is far more significant than anything ever envisioned for the global community. And it will require that we design and implement solutions to address the challenges ahead. Goals three, four, and nine relating to health, quality education and industry, innovation, industry innovation and infrastructure 
underline the need to strengthen the domestic research, technological, and industrial capacity to produce new and improved sustainable and competitive solutions for healthcare services, agriculture, infrastructure development, and for tackling climate change. Science and technology innovation will help accelerate progress and also, we hope, give us the wherewithal to do so within our planetary boundaries. We will need to do this, as we're trying to do here over the next couple of days, by creating the necessary partnerships across business, the scientific community and civil society and governments to meet the goals. While the SDGs are not legally binding, governments are already taking ownership and establishing their pathways to achieve them. However, as much as we're beginning to see the countries rallying around the agenda, we also continue to punish the planet with our actions. More than two billion people confront water stress and nine out of 10 city dwellers are breathing polluted air. The devastation caused by the natural disasters across the globe, which um, I think Michael really brought front and center as he went through the experience that we're currently having in the Caribbean and in the United States. It, they continue to cost us billions in restoring critical infrastructure. They're displacing millions and they're wiping away decades of development dividends and gains. Strengthening the resilience of institutions, of communities, individuals in our environment remains key to ensuring that sustainable development um, is achieved. Reducing disaster and climate risks in particular, and in particular bending the emissions curve by 2020, must be a top priority. The implementation of the Paris Agreement is therefore central to the success of the 2030 Agenda. The Paris Agreement, like the 2030 Agenda, was also signed by almost every country in the world. And after it was adopted, the agreement entered into force in less than a year, record speed in the international world. Testimony to the urgency of the action that is needed. To date, more than 160 parties have ratified it and the numbers are growing monthly. And so we come back to the point, I think one of the takeaway messages from Michael, the urgency is recognized. And I think this conference over the next couple of days, we're beginning to have this conversation about what is the action we need to take um, to ensure that we can deal with the unprecedented. The Paris Agreement sets an ambitious goal to keep average increase of global temperature well below two degrees and as close as possible to 1.5 and allowed every signatory to decide how they would contribute to achieve this goal and what would be the specific actions that they would undertake to reach the objective based on the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. It doesn't impose specific adaptation or mitigation actions, nor does it take any position on whether any specific technology should or should not be deployed. That is where this community has a significant role to play. Countries need to call on the best available science in order to decide on which options they undertake to combat climate change. And we must make access to the requisite technologies equitable to make progress. In the international sphere, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change acts as the United Nations body for assessing the science related to climate change. It was established to provide policymakers with regular scientific assessments concerning climate change, its implications and risks, as well as to put forward adaptation and mitigation strategies. Its assessments of climate change enable policymakers at all levels of government to take sound evidence-based decisions. One of the decisions that countries will be taking in the future is whether to deploy geoengineering technologies as, mitig as a mitigation measure to reduce the concentration of anthropogenic greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And the question about whether and how to deploy these types of technologies is uh, becoming more and more widely interrogated. Without referring to any specific technology, IPCC's last assessment report in 2014 recognizes that mitigation measures intersect with other societal goals, creating the possibility of co-benefits 
or adverse side effects. According to the report, these intersections, if well managed, can strengthen the basis for undertaking climate action. In 2018, the IPCC will issue a special report on pathways to achieve the objective of limiting the global increase in temperature to 1.5 degrees. The report will need to consider whether the contribution of technologies such as carbon dioxide removal will be needed to achieve that 1.5 degree path. Science will provide policy relevant information on these issues, but decisions on whether or not such technologies should be used need to be taken by societies as a whole within normal decision-making processes at subnational, national, and international levels. Some UN organizations and intergovernmental processes have started to address these issues. The parties to the Convention of Biological Diversity noted in December 2016 that the application of the precautionary approach, the customary international law, the general obligations of states with regard to activities within their jurisdictions, and requirements relating to environmental impact assessment may be relevant for geoengineering activities, but still form an incomplete basis for global regulation. This implies that we would have to consider what more will be needed. And you are the community that can help us answer some of those critical questions. The parties to the CBD have also called for more transdisciplinary research and sharing of knowledge to better understand the impacts of climate-related geoengineering on biodiversity and ecosystem functions and services, socioeconomic, cultural, and ethical issues, and regulatory options. This will help us to understand what type of rules and agreements these technologies would need to be made operational, what type of governance rules they would require, and eventually, whether an international regu regulatory framework can be put in place in a way that allows the deployment of new technologies while at the same time protecting from its anticipated risks. The United Nations Secretary General very recently reminded us that innovation is something that we must address. In his speech at the opening of the 72nd session of the General Assembly, he pointed out that technology will continue to be at the heart of shared progress, while noting that innovation as essential as it is to humanity, can also have unforeseen consequences. Science and technology drive progress. They improve health and living standards, boost economic growth, increase productivity and improve job conditions. But innovation can also have unplanned effects, particularly shifting the needs of the job markets and making some jobs redundant. They widen gaps in inequality along multiple dimensions. They challenge our ethical frameworks, for example. And so it is our duty, and yours as scientists, to investigate and assess all the possible consequences of the technologies being proposed, and to provide, working with other disciplines, the most accurate assessment, not only of the specific benefits of the technology being proposed, but also of its potential risks and impacts. While the various geoengineering technologies and their potential role to reduce the climate risks are being considered, it needs to be clear that whatever role they're given, it has to be done within the sustainable development agenda, and making sure that the overall achievement of the sustainable development goals is not compromised, and that we do not leave countries or people behind. I'm very encouraged to see that the scientific community um, is engaged uh, with other uh, sectors. It's been very inspiring listening to the two addresses uh, before um, and to see that this is not the first time we have come to this point. This is not the first time that we've had to ask those questions about how humanity um, and planet uh, how we work to make sure that we can thrive. And so I'm sure that with the scientific community and with an inclusive and open conversation that we will find a pathway through to ensure that by 2030 we achieve these goals um, and that um, we can all be living on a healthy, safe, secure <coughs> planet. Thank you very much.